For decades, the U.S. and China have been the leaders in the tech and innovation space, but Kenya is slowly taking her place on the world stage. For Kenyans, necessity truly is the mother of invention, and they're taking advantage of increased access to higher penetration rates and the proliferation of mobile phones to find solutions to local problems. Kenya is now more attractive than ever before for digital entrepreneurs and investors, and the local innovators are holding their own up against the foreign players. So just what did it take to get them here? What are their challenges, their successes, and their tips to others in this space? You're going to get to hear from them here on Business Now. Good afternoon. I'm Yvonne Okwara Matole, and these are the highlights of the show. On the show this afternoon, we focus on tech innovations that are changing the Kenyan business landscape. How are local innovators supporting and pushing their own applications? And we also get to know what makes these innovations tick. And indeed, like we said, you're going to hear from them in just a moment. So this is who we have here in the studio for you to discuss the tech and innovation ecosystem. Take a look at my guests on the show. Here is uh, that video now. I'm going to introduce them. Linda Bonish is the CEO of Lawyers Hub. We also have Mark Njagi, CEO of Vasili Cabs. It's a taxi hailing app. And Shiro Deori, the Vice President Engineering at Sendi, as well as Luke Maleche, who is the creator of Assistol. That's an app that's linking up the deaf with sign language interpreters. What a show and what an array of guests we have. And I'm happy to say that we've done, I think, two thirds. Uh, and I love it when we speak to women in business, particularly women in tech. So that is what is coming up here on the show this afternoon. But first, let's take a look at the news making headlines this afternoon. And we start off with TransCentury PLC that has reported a 34% revenue growth for the year ended December 31st, 2019, driven by improved performances, especially in two of its subsidiaries. Delay in releasing 2019 accounts is um, a result of significant ongoing restructuring in line with the strategic plan impacting on reporting timelines due to statutory and legal processes that needed to be accommodated in the audit process. Elsewhere, Britain has launched a health insurance cover that's designed to cover full hospitalization expenses of its policyholders upon hospitalization and discharge following a diagnosis of COVID-19. The Britain COVID-19 insurance cover guarantees a cash back of the full sum assured and does not require pre-medical screening. It'll be available to anyone up to the age of 75. And finally, the Capital Markets Authority has facilitated the admission of seven firms in the CMA regulatory sandbox since its launch in March 2019. The move is part of its strategic priority to leverage technology across the capital markets value chain as espoused in the 2018-2023 strategic plan. Great, so now that you're up to date, let's talk about the tech and innovation space. Now, many of those that are in the field are primarily seeking to provide a solution to local problems. Many of them employing anywhere from two up until 50 or more employees um, and providing those jobs in the Kenyan economy. So let's speak to all of them now, understand their um, challenges, their journeys and their successes. And you can get to ask them the questions that you want to. The SMS number is 22422. Or you can uh, tweet us at Citizen TV Kenya at Yvonne Okwara. The hashtag is business now. Any questions you have for them, any tips you want to know. And of course, uh, all your questions as well will be answered here this afternoon. Like I said, on my extreme left, we have Luke Maleche. Uh, uh, sorry? Moleka. Moleka, yes. Uh, from Assistol, and he'll tell us about that. He's also a competitor, runs Science TV. So, but it's good to have you here. Science TV is, of course, um, a TV channel um, for the deaf. Uh, and so those are some interesting things. And, and you'll get to hear his journey. Then we've got Linda Bonya, who's the CEO and founder of Lawyers Hub Kenya, providing quite a bit of legal assistance to those uh, in the space and also uh, providing guidance on policy um, around the space 
in the country. And then we've also got um, Shira Theori, who is from Sendi, and it's all about logistics. We'll be speaking to her. Driving trade in Africa, I believe, is what Sendi is all about. Um, so, Shira, let me begin um, with you on that one. So tell us a little bit about Sendi, um, you know, the solutions that you provide, and a brief journey of your growth for the last, uh, what, six to seven years that Sendi has been in operation. Uh, thanks, Yvonne. Um, so, Sendi was founded in uh, 2014 uh, by four founders, and at the time um, they were looking to solve the problem of moving goods from point A to point B. Uh, and at the time, uh, you know, the thing they noticed was that logistics and transportation in this space is super fragmented. Uh, so they came together and uh, created this platform uh, that allows uh, customers to find transporters. Um, and so that's what Sandy is. Uh, we've grown quite a bit in the past seven years. Uh, we provide end-to-end -end logistics, um, anything from first mile to last mile delivery. Uh, you can get that on Sandy. Um, and our whole mission is really to empower trade in Africa. Um, and so trade, for trade to happen, you don't just need to move things from point A to point B, uh, but you also need financial services and marketplaces. Uh, so we've ventured into those two areas as well. And so what's your role as vice president um, in charge of engineering? Uh, my role is really to uh, work with an exciting team of 60 engineers to build the uh, technology that drives this, uh, this mission for trade in Africa. So it's quite exciting. Yeah, and how many um, employees, uh, what's been the growth uh, journey of Sendi? Um, let's see from a customer perspective and mm -hmm. the services that you've been able to provide over the last six or seven years. Yeah, um, it, it's been quite the journey. Uh, we started with a handful of uh, employees back in 2014. Uh, we were less than 10 employees. Uh, we've grown to um, over 250 employees currently. Um, spun across the continent. So we have uh, employees sitting in Kenya, um, in Uganda, and recently in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we've done over a million deliveries, um, covered over three uh, million kilometers in doing those deliveries. Uh, we've uh, you know, made these deliveries to over 100,000 customers, uh, worked with the, over 5,000 um, uh, partners, and partners in this case uh, refers to riders and transporters that we have on the platform. So we've grown quite a bit in the past seven years. And employees as well, from you yeah. started off with what, 10? 10 to about 250. Wow, yeah. yeah. That's, that's major. That takes you from micro, I believe, to uh, small enterprises, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So great stuff uh, for that. Um, and let's hear from you, Luke. Um, Assistol, tell us about what this, uh, this, this app is, what it does, what solution it provides. I understand, you know, this was um, as a result of uh, COVID-19, you know, filling a gap that, that, that arose during that time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yvonne Okwara. Uh, my name is Luke Muleka, uh, the founder and managing director of uh, Science Media Kenya Limited. At Science Media, we have two products. The first one, as you've cor correctly put it, Science TV, which is a TV station broadcasting in sign language with uh, voiced overrides. Uh, that started way back in 2015. Then uh, I'll just do fast forward. In 2020, uh, during um, COVID-19, where everyone was uh, responding, to how they are going to help uh, each and everyone around the globe to fight this pandemic. We looked at, an, at it and realized that it will be very hard to have a sign language interpreter in the same room with the deaf and the ability to communicate because uh, WHO and the government uh, 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 were giving directives that for you, uh, like even the health practitioners, everyone was uh, supposed to mask up and also glove up. That means that you, when we are wearing a PPE as an interpreter, it will be very difficult for a deaf person to be able to communicate. Remember, they really depend on the gestures from the hand and also uh, the lips some of them that do uh, read the lip reading. lips. So we yeah. found that that will be very difficult. That's why we decided virtually to remove an interpreter uh, from uh, the isolation room. Actually, it's the idea started from how it would be in the isolation room. So from the isolation all the way to a virtual space through a mobile app. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I think uh, it's important that you raise that issue that, um, you know, the deaf don't just depend on the sign language. Yeah. Um, you know, it's also the facial expressions exactly. and for those that uh, read lips. And so that has developed, um, you know, from filling a need that was brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. And you're now thinking of scaling that up. Could you tell us um, a little bit about that? Like, you know, it's got longevity beyond COVID, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
what we realized was that uh, when we were thinking about this thing with my team sitting down and uh, just looking through it and how it would work, we realized that one of the most important thing that has been affecting the growth and um, development of a deaf person in terms of um, uh, acquisition of services and also uh, provision of services, because they are not just there to acquire services, they also provide services. We realize that an interpreter plays, plays a very crucial role in the life of a deaf person. So looking at that, we realize that employers would have wanted to hire deaf people, but one of the things that has been affecting them is that you only have an interpreter who will probably be in the office to wait to interpret for the deaf person. What of if we were to provide this to be acquired at the time the interpreter is actually needed. Mm. The other item was uh, general hospitalization issues, uh, maternal health. Deaf people have been having challenges of getting this because you find that most medics and practitioners in the space of uh, a medical fraternity might not be understanding sign language. The other issue has been assuming the deaf person is traveling, wants to attend a conference, there was always back and forth of, do I have to carry my interpreter? So you'll find in some cases they will leave out a deaf person to attend mm. a, a conference where they will deliver so much yeah. on that particular as contributors, but you find that they are left out because of the interpreters. So putting an interpreter to be gotten the time you require interpretation services was actually a very key component and going to drive the future development of assistol. Yeah, and, and I guess that um, you know also solves the problem of cost um, because a deaf person would often have to travel with their interpreter, yeah. and most will say um, you know that's an added cost. Yeah. So this is still providing the same service, um, you know, but but um, at a cheaper cost. Um, We'll come back to you because I really want to understand the story of this. Um, Luke has uh, a background in accounting and in banking. Um, and so I know the question we're all asking is, what is an accountant and a banker? What are you doing in, in a field such as this, providing solutions for? Because I think, you know, the stories behind all of these yeah. are surely very important. So, I mean, Luke, if you just feel free to share why you got into this space in the first place. Yeah, uh, it's a personal story, and I normally say that uh, is one of the issues that actually uh, drive, as you've just said, uh, some of these um, uh, techn I mean, innovations and just thinking. I normally say at some point you need to get to a situation you are not thinking outside the box, but just to think without the box. And uh, uh, that's something that I normally uh, live with as a mantra. It started way back uh, in my childhood as in I will say that the first day I was born uh, in this um, uh, on this world actually I was ushered into disability because the girl that I uh, I followed in our family uh, she was deaf and epileptic may her soul rest in peace she died in 2019 so what happened is when we were growing up actually I would um, be her rudimentary interpreter uh, when you probably visitors will come at home and we are having uh, probably aunties visiting and I realized that uh, because of having interacted with her most of the time, yeah. I would be able to do rudimental inter uh, rudimentary interpretation services. Uh -huh. yeah. But she went to school and she acquired a totally different language, which was Kenya Sign Language. Yeah. So when I also went to school, yeah. we just grew apart because mm -hmm. we could not be able to be French the way right. we used to be. And this r happens to each and every family that normally has a deaf person, you realize yeah. that once they acquire that sign language proficiency, it becomes very Then they're very cut hard. off, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that. So what happened is, uh, when I reached out now, the point whereby I came to Nairobi and I was working, then I started attending a place whereby there was a church service for the deaf, and I, was, I got interested. Then my question, actually, I, do, I did a flashback, that she was not able to enjoy any form of uh, entertainment way back when we were young because the time people will congregate even to speak and you find some of, the, uh, some of them think that when you are speaking, yeah. only the hearing, you're actually talking about them. Yes. So it was bringing that jittery. True. So then I realized that that breakaway should be brought to a convergence through entertainment. Yeah. So I started training the deaf, uh, young deaf guys at, at uh, Guadalupe in um, uh, Adam's Arcade. Uh, which is a Catholic church there, just to be able to perform some level of music because in, in, in school I used to be in choir. So I used to write music and I have an interpreter to change the music now into yeah. a, a language that the deaf would understand, then be able to help them to sign. And so we this grows um, from that and you decide to then quit your job 
exactly. form Science TV and now create a sister? Actually, Science TV came up at, uh, because I had now a program of okay. music and some uh, films yeah. that we've acquired some rights from the US uh -huh. and I wanted a program on TV. So when I visited most of the TVs, they didn't understand what I wanted. So I went and explained myself to the authorities. Yeah. I said, this is what I want. And they told me, OK, you are looking for only 30 minutes. Why don't we give you 24 hours and see uh -huh. how this works out? I and see. that's actually what happened, that we and got indeed. the channel and started now Science TV in 2017. OK, great. And, and, and that's really what it is. Yeah. It's that um, you know people see um, problems or challenges in yes. society yeah. and then start to innovate yes. to provide solutions to those. Um, we'll come back to you, uh, Luke. So, um, Linda, at, at Lawyers Hub, you provide a lot of services. What's your overall um, you know, assessment of the tech space and innovation in the country? You've heard from at least the first two we have um, here with us. Your, your thoughts on, on where we are as a country globally, you know, like a global picture of, of where we are? Okay. Um, I think Kenya is very innovative. We are an innovative nation. People work hard. We're always looking for ways to do things in, in a fresh way. And the startup scene here is pretty active. People are building. They are you know, trying to come up with you know, just new stuff. Um, if you see the capital as well that's coming in the country, it's not as it was before. Um, and so that's a great thing. In, within the policy space, um, and I think that's where the lawyers have come in, mm -hmm. we also are a startup. We came in wanting to build legal, you know, tech solutions for the legal sector. We're looking at how do we have our own Uber for legal services. Okay. And so when we came in, then it hit us. This is not how we envisioned it. Running a startup is hard. Who gives capital first um, to, to a startup? Uh, you know, and we know within the, within the country, capital is very old, is very old. Um, young people don't have a lot of money compared True. to the owners of capital who would rather build a mall um, than invest in in a startup. Um, and two, the policy environment does not actually separate between a new local business and an old business. So if I'm paying tax, I'm still paying it at thirty percent as a startup. Yet that's the same amount that the global businesses that are based in Kenya still mm -hmm. pays. And so we don't have um, this very specific culture in which you encourage new businesses to come through. Um, we also don't have room for failure. Um, if I get into a business today and I, I fail, I already have a PIN number. Yeah. I have a company uh, registered. If I want to go declare bankruptcy, there's a procedure for that. There's a court process for that. So there's no room in which the law allows you to fail and then begin again. Um, comparing to countries like um, Israel, for example, mm. they give you room that if you don't make it within this particular year, let, is, let us make it easy for you to wrap it up. Okay. Um, if I'm going to hire and I'm a startup, I can't access the person who's, who, I, I can't hire the PhD holder. Their salary is too high, yeah. but in certain countries will actually give you incentives and say, if you hire a PhD holder for your startup, then we won't ta you'll pay maybe, you'll not pay maybe income tax, but you can pay the corporation tax. Okay. So I think those are the challenges that we still haven't gotten as a country, right? Um, in t introducing things like digital tax for businesses, really just limits the tech ecosystem from, from thriving. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And um, so you started off obviously as providing a solution to lawyers, yeah. but then you've also ended up having conversations on you know, the wider policy uh, sector uh, you know, in the country. What's your assessment as to how the differences between the foreign um, innovators, the foreign companies, yeah. you know, the yeah. foreign owned versus the local. What, what advantages, disadvantages exist on either side? When I die, I want to come back to Earth as a male white man who went to, <laughs> who went to Stanford. Because capital is male and white. It okay. comes from Silicon Valley, a lot of the startup that we have. And so if you look at the reports and the trends that we have in Kenya, um, the white, uh, the actually foreign founders, especially from the US, would raise more in Nairobi. Um, they would come into Nairobi and set up a business and call it, let's say, Wakili, uh -huh. um, a Swahili term for whatever business they wanted to do. Before you know it, in a year, they would have raised money. Um, so that, that's one of our problem. Um, the local capital that we have does not go into startups. The government funds like pensions does not go into startups. If we looked at maybe what we do with NSSF, for instance, is there is there a possibility in which we could have NSSF invested in startups and then you know we get returns in, in sort of a few years? So I think that's one of the differences. And then two, um, in terms of skill, we have labs in let's say Stanford University studying business, how to do business in Africa. What are our universities actually doing to ensure that? any entrepreneur understands how to do business in Kenya. It's very unique to do business in Kenya, mm. compared to, let's say, Lagos um, in Nigeria. 
um, this market, we, you need to understand the people. Um, and uh, one of the things I think the former Safaricom CEO talked about was, you know, Kenyans have pe peculiar Pecu habits. Right. Just understanding how people consume, how they do this, that requires investment into research. Um, and we see the growth of, in Silicon Valley, for instance, the government invested in the research aspect of it into universities. And then universities sort of figured out a way in which to commercialize that investment. Uh -huh. The Kenyan National Innovation Agency now is trying to commercialize and to improve the space in which we commercialize intellectual property. So that means that even as a country, we must invest in research and we must understand our market, we must understand our products, and then we can figure out that whole you know, interaction between uh, companies, universities, and startups and see how we can commercialize them. Absolutely, and, and that's a, a great place, I think, for us to uh, take a break, I believe. We have uh, one more um, investor for you to hear from, um, and this was also just you know, a personal discovery of mine. So off I go to Western uh, Kenya at one point, and I quickly realized that there is no Uber. Or then I found out that there is one. We'll be speaking to the founder, um, the CEO of Wasili Cabs, and we'll be hearing about them. Did you know um, this exists? It's a local taxi hailing app uh, that exists in Nakuru and I think uh, serves the wider Western Kenya region. We'll be speaking to them as well as the rest of my guests. We'll come back and hear from each of them on their challenges and what their success points have been and where we go from here in the country. For you as an innovator, keep talking to us. The hashtag is business now. Back in a moment. Mic check, mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Unani skia vizuri kutoka pande, kutoka studio la pili. Mic check, one, two. One, two, mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, mic check. Yeah. Because they even have not created time for that. Good. So that someone can actually. 